Hey guys, and welcome to another day of Vlogmas, as well as the penultimate year of Miyazaki video, in which we will be discussing the amazing The Tale of the Princess Kaguya. Now this one was written by Isao Takahato and Riko uh, Sakaguchi, but was directed by Takahata, and I honestly think it's safe to say that this is his best film to date. This one was supposed to be released in 2013 alongside Miyazaki's The Wind Rises, kind of like they did back in the day with uh, The Grave of the Fireflies and My Neighbor Totoro. However, Takahata was taking so long to develop the storyboard that they ended up having to push the release of this one back a couple of months. So while this was still released in 2013, it was not released alongside The Wind Rises as originally planned. This one was released under the Japanese title Kagaya Hime no Monogatari and and was uh, based on the Japanese folktale, the tale of the bamboo cutter. Like I said, this can definitely be considered the crowning jewel of Takahata's career, and I have so much I could say about this, so I'm gonna try and keep it to a one coherent but two um, not incredibly long video. The film opens with a man working inside a bamboo grove to cut down um, specific stalks of bamboo. This man is a woodcutter named Miyatsuko and he lives with his wife um, in the countryside kind of like on the edge of this bamboo grove where he gets all his materials. A lot of this bamboo they then weave into baskets and sell to people but generally speaking they are pretty humble country folk. Something magical happens on this particular day because while Miyatsuko is working in the bamboo grove he sees one of the bamboo shoots start to glow and when he cuts it open a little it reveals this very beautiful miniature little girl in beautiful robes um, who is glowing. Convinced that she is some gift from the gods, Miyatsuko plucks her out of the bamboo shoot and takes her home to his wife, where she quickly becomes not this petite little fully grown princess, but turns into an actual human baby. Miyatsuko's wife is beyond excited because they are very old and yet have no children, so she is very eager to raise this little bamboo shoot girl as their own. However, because he found her in this little princess-like form, Miyatsuko is convinced that this little girl is meant to be a princess, and so he calls her princess, or Hime. It quickly becomes apparent not only to the woodcutter and his wife, but to the neighborhood kids as well, that there is something special about Hime. She grows really fast and really suddenly and unexpectedly, and the neighborhood kids start to call her Takenoko, or Little Bamboo. So Takenoko, or Hime, grows up in this very idyllic countryside setting where she and the other neighborhood kids are free to do pretty much whatever they want, and she finds herself particularly drawn in by a band of children under the sort of leadership of a slightly older boy named Sute, Sute Maru. Of course, what Hime doesn't know is that her father has been plotting a way to get her out of the countryside and into the capital because, as he says, she's never going to become a famous princess if she continues to live out in the country. So one day, the woodcutter uproots them all and moves them to a mansion that he's created in the capital for them and places Hime under the tutelage of a very strict governess whose job it is is to teach her how to be a woman of noble rank. Now Hime is a huge fan of being outdoors and running around and laughing freely and newsflash that is not proper for a lady of noble birth. The tutor pretty much tells her that she is going to paint herself, uh, do herself up, and then sit there quietly and giggle cutely every single day for the rest of her life. As soon as she comes of age, her father has a naming ceremony for her in which she is given the name Kaguya Hime and uh, is basically open for suitors and that is when her life completely starts to change. Now like I said, there's so much you could talk about with this film, but I feel like first of all I have to address the animation. Now if you've watched Takahata's previous film, My Neighbors the Yamadas, you will have seen a very similar animation style and I think it's safe to say that that film was kind of a um, practice run or a starting off point from which he then went on to develop this really beautiful watercolor style illustration uh, animation. I think the watercolor effect really serves to kind of set this really gentle magical tone for the entire film and I think that the use of line and color are really really important as well. When he is growing up in the countryside you see that everything is really really bright and really vibrant and feels very lush and yet when she moves to the capital everything's done kind of in more gray and brown tones and you can just see 
like the contrast in um, ways of life. As for lining, I think it tends to be very subtle, which again is something that uh, Takahata has used again and again in his films, but when there's a big emotional moment, when something really traumatic is happening, the lines get more bold, they get darker, they get more erratic and scribbly, and I just thought that was a really beautiful way of portraying emotion, and I would say overall this film has probably the most emotive animation of all of the Studio Ghibli films that I have watched so far. I also want to mention the music really quickly because um, I've talked about Joe Hisaishi in relation to Miyazaki and that he always, always does Miyazaki's films, but this is actually the first film that Hisaishi has done for Takahata. When the project first started coming together, there was actually another composer signed on to do the score for this film, but for whatever reason he had to drop out and um, Hisaishi being kind of Studio Ghibli's go-to guy, he stepped in and I think he created a really lush, really really beautiful soundtrack. A lot of people, myself included, think of the Spirited Away score as kind of Joe Hisaishi at his ultimate best and I would honestly say that this comes very close to Spirited Away. Um, I think it's a really rich sound and it really really serves to um, just enhance the atmosphere of the overall film. Thematically I think there's so much here that you could really dig your teeth into but I just wanted to kind of touch on two general topics. The first of which is definitely um, this conflict between old money and new money and the city versus the countryside. The woodcutter is really only able to move his family to the capital and create this very lush lifestyle for them because he is gifted wealth um, by the bamboo grove. Like if he hadn't had that little bit of fortune, he never would have been able to uproot them and move them to the capital. On the surface, the woodcutter is really able to break into the world of nobility. They live in a uh, mansion, they wear the best silks, they have a fantastic governess for their daughter, and by all appearances, they are um, accepted into more noble society. Behind closed doors, however, it is very much acknowledged that they are not of noble birth. They know that Kaguya Hime is not really a princess. Like, by birth, she's not actually a princess. She just, she, the title was bought for her, essentially. It's almost like they could buy class, but they couldn't buy respect if that makes any sense. The other thing I definitely want to touch on is the gender dynamic in Japanese society that this film portrays really beautifully. I'm not actually sure what exact time period this is in, though I feel confident in saying it is medieval of some sort, um, but you can really see that women in this society, in this era of Japan, uh, are not necessarily considered people, but they're more these rare objects uh, which men try and obtain. For example, during the courting process, Hime is astonished to realize that she's expected to marry a man without ever actually having met him and without him ever having actually seen her face to face. They talk through these bamboo screens the whole time, so she has to listen to these men confess their undying love for her, and yet she's sitting there thinking, you don't love me, you don't even know me, you've never even seen me, and, and she's just kind of horrified by the falseness of it all. By all accounts, it seems as though uh, Kaguya Hime is powerless because she is just an object, like I said, for these men to attain. And yet, although this story is set in a world where women are objectified, where women are anonymized, and where women um, objectively have no real control over their lives, you see that the women in this film have so much power. First of all, we have to start with the governess that the woodcutter hires when they move to the capital. Basically, she is hired help and so should be um, far below the head of household in ranking. But because the woodcutter is so um, out of touch with the customs of capital society because he knows that things should be done but he doesn't know how to get from A to Z, she actually wields a ton of power over him. Then of course even as an unattainable object, Kaguya Hime herself holds an immense amount of power over her suitors. She's not only able to entrance them with the very idea of her but she's actually able to um, manipulate them enough into doing crazy things for her, um, even dying for her. And finally I wanted to mention the woodcutter's wife because um, on the surface she very much seems like a passive woman. She doesn't fight him moving to the capital. She doesn't fight him trying to um, alter everything about their daughter, but she doesn't let him take away who she is 
deep down. Although she occasionally dresses up and entertains as she's supposed to based on their new status in life, she likes to live in this little like back house in their capital mansion where she can wear her simple clothing, where she can uh, grow her own vegetables, and where she can weave for herself and I feel like just that little act of rebellion even if she doesn't verbally rebel against her husband just that little act of you can't take away who I am at my core I think is one of the more brave things that is done in this entire film. And yes, that is really just scratching the surface of what this fantastic film has to offer, so I would really just recommend that you all go watch this if you haven't already. I really, really enjoyed it, and um, I will say that this is probably my favorite film by Takahata. Honestly, my only criticism of this film is that, again, I think his pacing is slightly off. The beginning of the film works really, really well for me, and then the last, like, 20 minutes, I feel like he forgot that, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be developing this part of the story and then kind of dumped a whole bunch of stuff in at the end and um, that was kind of a shame, but otherwise I think this is a beautifully done film and it's really too bad that it didn't win the Academy Award when it was nominated in 2015. So those were my thoughts on The Princess Kaguya by Asao Takahata and Studio Ghibli and um, I would love to hear what you guys think of this if you have seen it for yourselves and if not, go watch it. Honestly, you won't regret it. The next and last film I will be watching for my year of Miyazaki project is When Marnie Was Here, and that will be going up um, sometime this week. So thank you guys again so much for watching. I hope you have been enjoying this series of videos, and I will see you next time. Bye! Can you tell that after I get the Japanese lineup, my brain's like, whew, you did it! <laughs>